If you ever want to ball your eyes out, laugh hysterically, and rethink your entire life, look no further than a Pixar movie. I'm not a huge animation fan, but Pixar is not like that. Not only visually do they have a really unique style, their storytelling is to another level. In my recent venture studying storytelling, somebody recommended to me The Best Story Wins by this man named Matthew Lunn. Matthew has a wild career. He started off at 19 years old as one of The Simpsons' youngest animators. He eventually moved over to Pixar, has a wild story there, but ended up with story credits for Finding Nemo, Monsters, Inc., Toy Story, Up!, the list goes on. This book was filled with so much cool tactical advice about story structure, but also to never strayed away from what makes story so powerful. Well, it's wrapped up in our humanity. I reached out to Matthew on Instagram and y'all, I freaking geeked out when Matthew Lunn said yes to coming on this show to walk us through his really cool story of growing up in a toy store, literally, to losing his job at Pixar, true story, and fighting for his dream to help bring some of our very favorite stories to life. I came over to Pixar because Steve Jobs, who owned it, gave me a very compelling 10 minute pitch. We're gonna do something different. We're gonna put a dent in the universe. These eight seconds, you need to come up with a hook and there's four different hooks you can use. We watch Nemo's dad go through the story to find Nemo. It's not just about finding Nemo, it's about dad finding himself. That's the part mm -hmm. that people are not aware of because in school we never learn these things. So thrilled, y'all. Matthew Lunn is with us. And I told you I felt like the weird creep because on social media, I just like keep tagging you in things and reading quotes. And But this book right here, The Best Story Wins, this is a book I've been looking for because I feel like I, I come from an opposite world, Matthew, where I, I come in from the entrepreneurial space, small business, and they tell you over there, they're like, you need to learn how to tell stories to be a good marketer, which is true. But then I've thought in reverse where now I'm really interested in like storytelling for the sake of story outside of business. So I've been looking for books like this that tell folks how to tell good stories. And Matthew, you have quite the freaking career. And I feel like I'm talking to the boss here with storytelling. So I have a list of nerdy questions for you. I'm thrilled you're here. Hey. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us. It's my pleasure. I'm happy to be here. Let's start here. I'm going to open the book okay. to a page where you were talking about your family and you had, yeah. um, sounds like an awesome family, interesting, really interesting industry that they were in. But this is what you said. You said, I was encouraged to be a misfit by my dad. My dad and the rest of my family embraced and even encouraged me to be creative and different. And I wrote right on the side of that, how? Question mark. Yeah. How did they encourage you to be a misfit and be different? I think this is, I'm happy you have read my book and you enjoy it first, Heather. So thank you. Um, yeah, I grew up in a family that are business people. Now, fortunately, the business is doing something fun. They own toy stores and my family has, you know, owned toy stores for four generations. And while you do get to have fun running a toy store, it's still a business. Right. And every, every one of them have their alter egos of what they would have done in another life, be an actor or a musician. My dad wanted to be a Disney animator. And so when he ended up being heavily inspired to take over the company, he had to pass on the Disney dream. Then mm -hmm. I came along and like any kid, you draw cartoons when you're a kid, because when you're a kid, everybody is a creative. We're all dancers and singers and actors when we're kids. And I had a unique family where I think they all really wanted me to pursue a creative job hmm. so they could vicariously live through me. But they, but it was especially my dad. My dad ended up growing up in the 50s, was a teenager in the 60s, and was a 20-year-old in the 70s. Very hippie dad, making candles with wax, 
in the kitchen and making a lot of other things too. We won't get into that, but he was a very creative guy. And I think he enjoyed telling me that hobbits are real, Santa is real. The world of make-believe is just as real as this world. Mm. Still to this day, I still don't know the truth about many things. But my dad really, he wanted me to embrace just being me, being, being creative and swimming against the, the current with everybody else. Mm. So this is what happens when you have a dad like that. You end up working for 30 years or more in the film industry yeah. and TVs and books being different and entertaining people. That was a long answer. No, it was a good one. And I'm glad you leaned into that element because what kept, the word that kept coming up for me when you were talking was imagination. And I've noticed in myself that as I'm a late bloomer, man, like trying to tap back into that side of myself that's been shut off for like 20 years of the childlike and what if, and just expanding yeah. what could be the possibility. It's limiting me so much in my storytelling. And I'm just wondering, like, how did they foster that in you? Or how do you tap back into that child imagination play side? I That's a, a, a good question. I guess there is the one that all parents can do and people can do even as adults, which is continue to be, think like a student. And what I mean by that is not a student, student as in the academic side so much, but don't rest on just, I'm done. Continue to take classes, experience things that maybe scare you a little bit mm. to keep learning. My parents gave me a healthy diet of comics, of how to draw books. They signed me up, probably because they just wanted to get me out of the house during the summer, but the pottery classes and the camps and the all those things, they were just constantly letting me continue to experience something new. Hmm. And I would say that they never they never got mad at me or reprimanded me for doing something that was creative, that was maybe could be destructive to the house. So for example, deciding I'm going to paint something with house paints on my wall, or I'm going to start building something with exacto knives and cardboard and I'm going to build it on the kitchen floor as I'm cutting into the linoleum on the kitchen floor. Yes, my mom got mad later, but I think I was just, it's because my dad was creative like this, that I just was always building something, making something. And when I, when it came to actually, I also had things laying around the house. We weren't a, a family like the Royal Tannenbaums where there was just maybe we were a little bit like that, but we just had stuff everywhere. So I could pick up an exacto, I could pick up a Sharpie, all these things that, you know, as a parent, you don't want your kids touching. And I was just always encouraged to create. And also I got positive feedback from my parents, even if what I was creating was maybe strange. And also I would say I probably got more creative, positive feedback from my dad. My mom mm -hmm. She's from Germany and she immigrated when she was yeah. to the States when she was 21 and she's definitely a, a clean person. And so some of that did ruffle her feathers, but for the most part, I was just encouraged to be creative and do weird things. <laughs> How did they feel when you quit school to go work on the Simpsons? Were they excited for you or were they a little cautious? First, which maybe this is not the norm anymore. But when I went off to college, when I was 19, I went to this animation school in LA. It was created by Walt Disney before he passed school. away. It's called Cal Arts. It's this place that is on a mountain near LA. And the students are called the Freaks on the Hill. It's where Tim Burton went to school and Danny Elfman and Pee Wee Herman and Almost all the directors at Pixar and at Disney. And 
my parents said, you should pay for all your school. We're, we'll just, we're here to support you, but we want you to really appreciate it. So you're going to pay for it. Wow. So I paid for my own school. And so I took it very seriously of, I'm not here just to party, mm -hmm. but this is a step for me to get a job and live my dream. When I was going to the school that first year, I made a student film and I had a plan, which was even at 19, I'm going to work in the animation industry. And I got pretty lucky when I did get a job offer from a, a director on the Simpsons. And I took the job and my parents were very happy that I took the job, especially my dad. So I bet. So proud. So insanely proud. I'm wondering, like, when you were in those rooms, and this is, you were an animator at this time. You hadn't started writing yet because you started writing later at, mm -hmm. at Pixar. First off, I would say that, because I don't usually highlight these in my, when I do presentations, because I usually get a short amount of time, but there were ups and downs in the last 30 years. And there's still ups and downs all the time. And mm -hmm. that's something that everyone's going to face. Nothing is just, it works every time. And so Rich. I worked on The Simpsons as an animator for a year, third season, best season of The Simpsons. It was awesome. And then for some reason, I got a really compelling pitch to go over to Pixar. 80 people, startup company. Nothing. They had not made Toy Story. But when I heard the pitch for Toy Story, I was so moved that I did not stay on The Simpsons for the fourth season. And I took this job at Pixar. What moved Now, you? I think a couple of things. As we know, as you have probably talked about and you read in my book, we make decisions based on emotions, not logic. Mm. I was leaving The Simpsons. I had a good paying job. I was 20 years old. Number one show, animated show on TV. I came over to Pixar because Steve Jobs, who owned it, gave me a very compelling 10-minute pitch that, and Steve, we're going to do something different. We're going to put a dent in the mm -hmm. universe, and we're going to make the first CG animated film, and we are going to do something different that the, than the Disney company would ever do. Because the Disney company at the time had a monopoly, Prince, Princess, Fairy Tale Village, musical numbers. He said the movie was going to be about toys. That's why they reached out to me because some of my friends at the studio knew I, my family owned toy stores. And then also, I don't know if this is embarrassing to say, but the studio was going to be not in LA, but in the San Francisco Bay area where my family was mm -hmm. and my girlfriend. So, Hey, emotions. We make Every decisions reason. on love all the time. And thank God I had a girlfriend at the time in the Bay Area. So I took the job. Wow. And leading up to the question you were asking now, what was the question you were asking? Let me let me ask about that because you take a risk. And I'm so thank you for highlighting that things are up and down because it's really easy to look at your life and be like, well, that must be nice. At 19, he yeah. got the Simpsons and he got to do this and that. But you take the risk, you do what the motivational quote says and burn the ships and whatever, Yeah. but then it didn't end up working out that's and you found yourself. That's what we were leading to. Yeah. So now I'm animating on Toy Story, animating right. those little army men, animating Woody, Buzz. It was pretty amazing working at a place that is, I guess was still under a hundred people. Hmm. There was the chance that it, it felt special that we were doing something special, something that was going to, if it worked, it was going to be really cool. And then the Disney company that we were getting the funding from to make Toy Story decided we're shutting it down. We don't believe anybody's going to watch a CG animated film, a film animated in a computer, an animated film with, with, with no prince or princess. And I remember after making this big move to leave the Simpsons, to come to Pixar after a year, all the animators were let go. go. The director, 
he was so sorry. I remember when I went into his office, he was teary-eyed. And he was also teary-eyed because he felt responsible for us moving our lives to Pixar. Hmm. But also, he had been laid off from other films that he had worked on, that he had he started working on, like The Brave Little Toaster was John Lasseter. But he said, I promise if anything changes... I will call you. And then now I, here I am on your talk show telling you, now I am without a job. I'm moved back home with my parents, the beginning of the end. And mm -hmm. I'm working at a temp agency, which will send me anywhere to Nordstrom Rack to pick up shoes, to work as a, the person answering calls at a, a business. Now, I could have just curled up in a ball and just gave up and said, that was exciting. <laughs> but I guess I don't have a give or give up personality. And mm -hmm. I ended up looking for what other studios there were in San Francisco. Now, in the early 90s, there were not many animation studios. Mm -hmm. But there was one that did commercials, like for McDonald's and Cheerios. And I worked there as an assistant and I told them I'm a story person because I really wanted to get into the story part yeah. of making films. So I was working part-time at this commercial studio, coming up with gags, writing stuff. And now this went on for a year. My girlfriend started helping me pay for my car that was leased. It was a little embarrassing. Then I got a call and the call was, Matthew, we'd love for you to come back as an animator on Toy Story. We're going to keep going. And I said, I really love you guys. I really want to work with you guys, but I want to get in the story department. Now, when I was at Pixar for a year, I was sneaking into the story department all the time, helping them. So I knew that was the best fit for me. Uh, I just always have thought, I, I've always been more of a story guy. Mm. And they said, we don't have anything available right now because we're right in animating the end of the film. But if anything comes up, and that's when I really felt like I blew it. Yeah. And but thank God, about six months later, I got a call. Six and I kept, sending, I kept sending my portfolio to Pixar, showing them my storyboards and writing. And I wrote a little mock children's book. And then they called me up and they said, we're going to make Toy Story 2. Mm. And we'd love for you to come in as one of the story people to do storyboards and help write. And it was like the heavens opened, a beam of light shined. And it was like after a year and a half. Oh, but... That whole waiting time, the whole uncertainty time, and is it's so is real. Hard. The all is lost moment in a story. So that was that, that that's was the real cool. stuff, Matthew. Lon. That is the real stuff. Thank you for sharing that. And a year and a half isn't that long, but dude, when you think you gave up your dream yeah. or working with the right people, that can freaking drag. Yeah. It was rough. I, and I still remember the lowest moment of that whole year and a half. I got called in at this temp agency to end up taking Halloween bags for kids who were going to go Halloween. They were durable bags that I needed to put in plastic bags and put into a box, hundreds of them. And the characters on the bag <laughs> were these guys, the aliens on the bags. And I'm thinking, what has happened? I guess at that point, you're like a main character in a film where you mm -hmm. could give up mm -hmm. and then the movie's over. <laughs> Nobody wants to watch that. Or you can keep trying. Yeah. And I kept trying by finding whatever work I could to help me get better at my passion. I also went back to college and took more art classes in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And I just consistently kept, in a friendly way, sending my portfolio back to Pixar, letting them know I'm still alive. I'm still here. And it fortunately paid off. 
I want to really holler at what you just said. Waiting doesn't mean sitting on your ass and praying that the universe shows up. It will show up when you've done everything you know how to do and you continue to do that over a year and a half. You said a minute ago, I was one of those story people. And I was wondering, because I'm so jealous. I think it'd be so cool to be in a room full of people with like boards and ideas and all of that. And I'm wondering what are story people like? Like when you enter those rooms, is there a common denominator, a through line with all these folks? Or what is a story person? That's a good question. I know I throw this out saying I was a story guy. And, but the thing is that, okay, I'll share what it's like at, at, at a place like Pixar. So somebody that's going to be in that room, which on every Pixar film, the those first kind of 10 to 15 films, there's only about 10 story people in a room. You're also going to have people who are taking notes and managers and producers, mm-hmm. but the people who are actually there digging through the story to figure out who's the main character or main characters, what do they want in the story? What's their goal? What are the obstacles they're going to go through and how are they going to change? What's going to be the epiphany for the audience? Because as we watch Nemo's dad go through the story to find Nemo, it's not just about finding Nemo. It's about dad finding himself. It's Mm -hmm. about dad going from an overprotective father who fears the world to becoming less overprotective and comfortable with letting Nemo live his life. That is not an easy process to find a story. And you need to have the ability to be somebody that leaves your ego at the door and realizes when you pitch ideas and someone doesn't like a particular idea you're pitching, it's not that they don't like you. Right. They just don't like that suggestion or direction. And when you don't like a direction that somebody is taking the story into, what do you do? Do you just say, that sucks? No. (laughs) Because you'll just kill the energy in the room. And that's, you'll release, like I talk in my book, you'll release all that cortisol and create anxiety. And nobody creates well under anxiety. You want to keep things fun. So when you don't like an idea, I always say, start off with yes and. Yes yeah. And what if we ended up having the characters do this instead? It's improv. And mm-hmm. so when I think about all of the things that I have experienced in my life and I've studied and I think about when I'm in a story meeting, there's a little bit of being somebody who does improv. Somebody who keeps the energy in the room. You never kill a scene. You keep it going and you play well with others, basically. As a story artist, you also need to know how to draw. But not everybody has to do that because there's writers who don't draw. But you're thinking about, and then the other thing is understanding the principles of storytelling, which which I've listed in my book, but I've tried to share those in a way that isn't just for people in entertainment, but people in business will be able to mm-hmm. find relatable. I, it's, you, it's fun. I do enjoy figuring out a story puzzle. And the nice thing is that there are rules that you can hold on to like an anchor that you know you're going in the right direction when you're developing a story. You know you're a going story, in the right direction. What's that? You know you're going in the right direction. You can feel that. And there's times where you're creating a story with your gut. You're like, I'm passionate about this story. That's good. But you need to package it, that feeling, that spark, in a story structure that people will be familiar with and will be able to follow. That's the part Mm -hmm. that people are not aware of because in school, we never learn these things Mm -hmm. is the story structure, the hero on the journey. How do you take that spark of an idea? And that can be the idea for a book or a movie can also be the idea for um, a startup of a presentation. You want to make it work. It starts with a spark, but then how do you frame it so that People are going to like it. They're going to be awake and they're going to be moved and 
inspired. I'm getting fired up now. So. Gosh, there's so much there. I'm glad you brought the passion piece. That was something that I had written down. I wanted to ask you about in the book that I was a little confused about, and I didn't know sure. how to decipher this because I'm a passionate gal. Like I have no problem with that, but honing yes. that back in the structure piece to it, ding, ding, ding. That's what your girl's working on. But this is what you said in the book. It's something on the lines of, if you want to tell a story that is memorable and move people to act, you must take them through a roller coaster of emotion. So I'm like, yes, passion. But then later on, it was page 46. Let me find this real quick. And I agree with this too. You said that you need to be vulnerable and honest to create authentic stories, but you must also exercise restraint when delivering your message. Because if you hammer home the conclusion you want the audience to reach to overtly, your story will feel preachy or moralistic. And so I was, oh my goodness. And I bet maybe the answer is the structure you're talking about. But if we're taking people through a roller coaster of emotions and that's the intention, how do we do that in a way that's not preachy and moralistic? Yep. So the first part is taking people through a story that is like a roller coaster. What I mean by that is we love a story that has highs and lows. We are the type of people that we enjoy and need tension and release in our lives. When we don't have tension and release, life can become boring. Hmm. It can be just either life is sad all the time with no, no ups or downs. It's just life is sad or life is happy all the time. Like you're just on Instagram, doom scrolling at night. It never stops. It, there's because it's just yeah. either dopamine. But the thing is, the great stories are ones that have happy moments, sad moments, happy moments, sad moments. They go back and forth. There's dopamine, there's oxytocin, there's endorphins. Those are the ones that, it's like when you eat a meal. We've just all had Halloween, right? My, my girls just wanna keep eating candy, which is just, but it's like eating a well-rounded meal. When you eat a well-rounded meal, you feel better at the end and it was more fulfilling. That's like a story that has highs and lows, different emotions. So that's the first thing. The other thing I was going to mention, remind me, what was your, what was the second thing? No, th this is good because you mentioned the highs and lows and highs and lows. And then later on in the book, you talk about being mindful that I guess those oh, highs being, don't go too high. Yes. Or the lows the, too low. <laughs> the magical thing is that when you have these highs and lows in a story juxtaposed, when they're right next to it, the movie up. You have a couple, I'm mad at they're married, they want to have kids, they're getting the nursery ready, they're painting the, the, the baby's room. All of those emotions you're feeling right now, that high, is the release of dopamine. Dopamine is released when we feel anticipation, they're going to have kids, we feel happy for them, and the release of dopamine makes us very focused. And then when you go to the next image of them in the hospital and the wife is crying and there's a doctor there and we see the husband and we get, they're not going to have kids that going from this high to this oxytocin, sad moment, that tension and release it it's juxtaposed. And that's what gets us a choke in our throat mm -hmm. gets us teary eyed because the chemicals in our body have just changed tears of joy. Tears of sadness have a different chemical in them. That's, That's going on. The, la yeah. the next thing, just to bring this up, there's the theme in a story. Now, I made a, during the pandemic, when we're all told, stay in the house, don't do anything, I couldn't help but make a, a film. And so I ended up making a short film called Sprite Fright. Now, it, I it's on YouTube and... I wanted to make a story that was going to be fun. It was also going to be PG for any parents out there. Don't watch this with your young kids, okay? But I wanted to have a story that communicated my how I feel about what's going on in the environment, mm -hmm. climate. But see, that's a touchy subject. Not everybody, mm -hmm. people feel differently about this, and we've been preached to enough about it. So I wanted to make a story 
that had a theme of respect nature or else, but I wanted to do it in a Mel Brooks comical way where you see cute little Smurf-like creatures have their way with humans that disrespect the forest. But there's still a hero, there's story structure, there's highs and lows, and I did it to entertain myself and had a group of talented people to join me. And sometimes I notice on the comments, people go, oh boy, that's the best environmental message thing I've ever seen. But it reached mm -hmm. everybody and it wasn't preachy. That's what the theme was. was when you say a theme. So there's like a, a the message yeah. you're trying to say without saying it. At the end, I never said it in the story, but at the end, people got that the theme, just like Jurassic Park, mm -hmm. is respect nature or else. People, when it comes to a theme in a story or being inspired by a talk or a message, you don't want to tell people the theme. You want people to put together the pieces and figure it out themselves. So instead of telling people the answer is four, you say one plus three. Yeah. And people put the pieces together. Everybody in the audience, if you've done it well, is not getting a mixed message. They all go, wow, that movie up was all about, there's always another adventure out there for everybody, no matter what your age, gender, situation, anything. That's the theme. You want to make people feel the theme instead of being told it. And I wonder in the business marketing world where it's taught, and it makes sense, and maybe it's different roles, but that you want to, like the hook, you tell them what you're going to tell them. It's very obvious from the beginning, this, this, because these are my points or whatever. And I'm yeah. wondering as you're talking, I wonder if that would, we could even play with that and be more effective in marketing if we got away from that normal structure and then had more of a theme you hinted towards things, which is risky, but. When I come into a company to do uh, rebranding, a company is like, our theme, our story is getting stale. We've lost our North Star. I get pulled in and the very first thing I do is I work with the everybody at the company if I can figuring out what is the theme of the company, okay? So when I came into, for example, Adidas or Adidas 10 years ago, the company was divided like it was a 1980s film. There were jocks and there were nerds. And so basically it was like the creative people who want to wear Adidas for fashion. And then it was the sportsy people that believed Adidas was for sport. Mm. I had to figure out what is a theme that they both believe in, that they could come together as one. It took a while to do this. You have to get the CEO on board. You have to get everybody on board. And that theme eventually was whether you are an athlete or you are into fashion or you're creative or if you think about that way, you're creative. You're creative when you're on the basketball court. You're creative when you walk out the door and you look good. And then once we knew that the theme was calling all creators, then it doesn't limit you on who is going to endorse the product. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to be sports people anymore. It can be musicians. It can be actors. It can be anybody who is creative. The first thing is to figure out, and this is the same thing we do for a Pixar film or a, a film I'm directing. What is the theme? What is the message? What is the heart of the story? And then from there, you can start to share moments from your life, metaphors, experiences that connect to that theme of a time you really felt creative. Mm. That first article of clothing you ever purchased for yourself that you felt so good about and you felt so creative and it, and it empowered you. I always figure out what's the theme Life insurance would be being prepared, right? <laughs> then I think about what is the most be prepared moment you've ever experienced? And mm -hmm. then what is the least most prepared moment you've ever experienced? Interesting. And whenever I'm doing a talk or I'm sharing something with a theme like this, I start off with my worst prepared moment and I share 
that's what we're trying to do with our life insurance is that people don't get into a really bad, unprepared moment. And then I wrap it up with the most prepared moment. God, that's but so good. the key is don't use examples that are business related. Share something that happened to you that was funny or sad when you were a kid or in college mm -hmm. or as a parent. That is going to make people listen to you. As soon as you start using a business example, people go, oh boy, here yep. we go. Yep. So that's what I think about. Preach. That was gold, y'all. That was gold. The structure piece, storyboarding. Now, obviously, I'm not an animator. I don't work in this environment. However, I was interested in learning that. So I looked up online, like, how do you learn storyboarding? And I found this many things on the internet. And I'm just wondering if you could share just high level, a couple of concepts of what storyboarding is, because I think even if people like me who are writing scripts for social media and doing short form video and stuff, I think concepts and that would probably be really helpful to create structure. Yeah. But there's nothing out there, Matthew. I don't know if it's just like a hidden golden thing or what. Storyboarding has been going on since the beginning of film. If it's somebody taking a napkin in a bar and sketching out, I want to have this person this close to the screen and I, things like that. When it comes to storyboarding, the way to think about it is it's visual storytelling. When you are posting something on Instagram or Twitter, we all know that people like and share photos and videos. Yeah, That's because we are a visual storytelling people. We get lazy when it comes to reading stuff but a picture paints a thousand words. When you think about every shot in a film, when you think about every image in a picture book, the images communicate a story through the composition, through the color, through the value, how dark, how light things are, the expression on the characters. Mm -hmm. These are things that you're thinking about as a storyboard artist when you're composing a shot. Because what you're doing is you're taking the script and you want to communicate it visually. So when it comes to time to either actually film the scene in a film that's live action or animate the characters, you want to make sure that the shots are conveying visually what's in the script. So this is obviously something that would be a very long description to share, but I think we all know that images make us feel a certain way, color, lighting, expression, the yeah. characters. And so a storyboard artist has to think about those things, take the script and end up visually communicating when something is intense, when something is calm, the movie Jaws. There's a couple people in a boat. There's a shark that's banging into the boat, wanting it to sink. How do you communicate something that's very intense? Yeah. You do that through composition and color. And so a storyboard artist, though, will draw those images. Now, the reason why is to be able to figure out what it's going to look like visually before we spend a ton of money and animate it or get Tom Hanks on set and start filming him. You can't just go out there with your camera and just hope it's all magically going to come right. together. You have to figure out where the characters are going to go, what the color, the lighting is going to be. And there's that part of storyboarding. Now, there can be storyboard artists that just get handed the script. They translate the words into visuals. But then you can also be a storyboard artist that doesn't even have a script. And you start telling a story where there's not even words, like mm -hmm. in the 10 minutes of the movie up, there's no characters talking. It's just mm -hmm. images and some very moving music. So that is the quick two minute description of what a storyboard artist does. <laughs> I think in your you know spare time, you should just write another book on that so I can read it. <laughs> we have just a couple minutes left. I'm going to do a couple quick rapid fire questions from our audience, okay. and then we'll get you out of here right at the top of the hour. Dane Scott Sullivan asks, how do you create interest when you're telling a story to a crowd who's not interested? There is a couple of ways of doing that. And I, I'm sure if you ask that question to other people, they may just send you in circles and not give you an answer. 
will give you an answer. There are four different ways to do it because you have the attention span of people is about eight seconds. Yeah. You've got to have a great hook. When you get up on stage, when you start watching a film, you start reading a book. These eight seconds, you need to come up with a hook and there's four different hooks you can use. One hook is sharing something unusual. We all know that the world wears shoes, but what if we didn't have to wear shoes anymore and we could walk around? That's something unusual. You can start off with something unusual or something unexpected. You can come walk up on stage and you're in a giant poop emoji outfit or something, right? I just bring that up because that was my Halloween outfit this year. And then the third one, everybody else in my family dressed up as Barbies. So I thought I'd do something <laughs> completely different. The third one is landing people in an action. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when you come up on stage, you land people right into an action and you say, I was 12 years old the first time I saw a dead body. You have everybody's attention. And yeah, that's the yeah. line of Stephen King's book, Stand By Me. And then the other one is you land people in an emotion. Hmm. And that one means you come up on stage and you start sharing a sad moment from your life. Start having, you, you come up on stage and you're like, I, I just got a call five minutes ago that my wife is leaving me. That's very emotional. So the hooks you have is something unusual, unexpected, land people in a conflict or an emotion. Boom. Eight seconds. You've got to grab people somehow. Okay. We'll do this last one and then we'll end it here. Stephen okay. Nichols said, how do you know something is not working? Often writers, especially when there are several, eventually come to a consensus that things are great and polished and they'll just fall flat with audiences because there's too much or lack of pathos or whatever it is. Well, a little bit of that is experience. Mm -hmm. I've worked in this business a long time. It's not like I'm just a baseball player that's a rookie that goes up and hits a home run by chance every once in a while. A good baseball player is one where the coach says, I need you to hit a line drive. I need mm -hmm. you to hit it over a home run, ground it, bunt it. It's not just about luck. So the thing is, when you've done something long enough, you have the experience to know what is going to have a better chance to land with the audience or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. So experience. Also, I am always trying to get my stories in front of an audience. It doesn't have to be all at the same time to be able to get their feedback. Just not for them to tell me what they want the story to be, because that's going to water down the story. But I just want them to know, do you know who the main character of my story is? Mm -hmm. Do you know what they want? Do mm -hmm. you know why it's tough for them to try to get what they want? And how do you think they changed at the end of the story? I'm just asking questions because if they answer all those, then I know, okay, I'm do it's working. But then also I love when I'm directing something, I've worked on a project and I go to the theater I love to just sit in the back row and see, did everyone laugh at where I wanted them to laugh? Did everyone cry where I wanted them to cry? Then I know it worked. You want to try to figure that stuff out before you've spent the other couple of hundred million to make it. But it's experience, it's trial and error, and it's feedback. Good. This book, Best Story Wins, it's so good. So good. Thank you for writing it. Absolutely linked up in the show notes. Is there anything else you want to direct our listeners to? I would just say, just like when we were kids, keep creating. Keep having fun. Don't give up. Come on. I am happy that I've created something that will give you some inspiration to keep you going. Because it's just like a character in a movie. Just don't give up. Just keep swimming. Okay. That's right.